So the pulmonary system, the main goal here is gas exchange, specifically taking in oxygen from the air and getting it into the blood, and then getting rid of CO2 in the blood, and getting rid of that through your breath into the air. So now let's talk about anatomy. We're talking about gross anatomy first. Looking at the lungs, we see that the lungs are divided into multiple lobes. So if we look at the right side of the lung, we see that the right side of the lung has three lobes. The superior lobe, the middle lobe, and the inferior lobe. If you see the left side, you see it's a little different. There's only two lobes here. And why is that? Well, what other organ is in the, in the chest on the left side? So we have the heart here taking the space. So that's why there's only space for two lobes on the right side of the on the left side of the lung. Now the other thing we want to think about is aspiration. So if you swallow something and it goes down your trachea instead of your esophagus, where is it going to go? Well, it's all going to be based on anatomy. Which way will be easier? So you can see from this picture, you see that it's easier to go down the right side of the lung than it is the left because the left has more of a has a higher angle. So if you have like an aspiration pneumonia or something, which is basically inflammation of the lung resulting from a foreign body, you're most likely going to see that aspiration pneumonia on the right side of the lung. Now, which lobe will it be? Well, that's going to depend on the position of the patient. So if the patient is upright or supine with the aspiration, the foreign body is most likely going to end up in the lower lobe. So it's kind of easy to think about that because if you're upright or something, then gravity is going to force it all the way down to the inferior lobe. However, you're lying on the, on the right side, then the object usually settles in the upper lobe. Okay, So if you're lying on the right side, object se settles in the upper lobe. If you're upright or supine, object settles in the right lower lobe. Okay, Next, we're going to talk about the diaphragm. This is the dome-shaped muscle uh, separating the thoracic chest from the abdominal cavity. And what happens is when you inspire this diaphragm muscle goes downwards, okay? And when it does that, you're gonna get a negative pressure inside the thorax, and that's gonna draw air into the lung. And the best way to imagine this is to think about a syringe. You think about the diaphragm like this black thing here. You pull it down, you're creating negative pressure in the syringe, and so remember that things always go down pressure from higher to lower pressures. So it's gonna to, to go down from here, down into the negative pressure, and that's how you draw fluid into the syringe. And it's going to be the same idea for the lungs. You draw down your diaphragm, you're pulling, pulling, you're going to get negative pressure. Excuse me. And you get negative. I'm struggling here. You get negative pressure here. So air is going to go through the mouth into the lungs. Okay. So that's how it is. Finally, the diaphragm is innervated by the phrenic nerve. That's C3 to C5. So if you irritate the diaphragm, you can see, you can have. Feel that irritation or pain refer to other parts of the body, for example, in the shoulder, which is innervated by C5. So if you have shoulder pain for some reason, it might be because of diaphragmatic irritation. Now let's look at the airways, the airways of the respiratory system. We could break it down. First of all, we have the trachea, which is the very large airway. It's going to divide eventually into the bronchi. Okay, there's the left and the right bronchi here. And then these bronchi are going to divide and divide and divide and divide. You can see they're going to branch out many, many, many times, you get secondary, tertiary bronchi. If you look at the very edges here, this is where we get something called bronchioles, okay? So bronchioles are the very edges. All this stuff before that is bronchi. And these bronchioles get smaller and smaller. You get terminal bronchioles, then you get respiratory bronchioles, and finally you get these alveolar sacs. This is where gas exchange is gonna occur. The alveolar sacs, the very thin-walled um, parts of the lung, and they're surrounded by blood vessels, as you can see. So the thin walls and all the blood vessels allow you to have gas exchange from the alveoli over to the blood. Now I want to talk about different parts of the structure. It's all pretty much pure memorization in my opinion here. Uh, it can help by looking at this chart. You see that cartilage goes all the way up to the bronchi. So all the way up to, you see, I told you bronchi go all the way up to here. All these very, the very edge of this picture is all bronchi, okay? After that's bronchioles. So you have cartilage all the way up to there. Next we have cilia. cilia. Remember, these are these thin little wavy structures that help propel stuff. We're going to talk about its function a little more in detail later. But cilia go all the way up to the terminal bronchioles. Okay, so the cilia go farther than the cartilage, go all the way to the terminal bronchioles. And then looking at smooth muscle, you see smooth muscle goes even further all the way to the respiratory bronchioles. So not just not in the alveolar sacs. Remember, smooth muscle 
what is it going to do? It's going to help you control dilation and constriction of these airways. So that's going to regulate how much air is going through. Okay. Type of epithelium is a little sim. It's kind of simple at least. It goes to basically from higher to shorter. So you get pseudo stratified columnar. You get regular columnar. You get cuboidal, and then you get cubo simple cuboidal and simple squamous. Okay. So you get, you get shorter and shorter as you go down. Finally, we'll see we'll see some additional cells. In the trachea, bronchi, and bronchioles, you see goblet cells. Goblet cells will secrete mucus, so that's why you get mucus all up in here because of go goblet cells. Then we'll see club cells. We're going to talk about what club cells do, but they help do a little bit of surfactant. They do a little bit of um, toxin de degradation, and um, and then finally you get to the alveoli. Alveoli have their own cells. We're going to talk about all these cells later. So just this chart's a little easier. It's it's a lot of memorization. I, th I hope this chart makes things easier, as you can see. Goes further, basically one step further every time from cartilage to cilia to smooth muscle. You get one step further every time. Um, this alphabetical order is cartilage, cilia, smooth muscle. And the last thing to note is the conducting zone versus the respiratory zone. So this part from the trachea all the way down to the bronchial is the conducting zone. What this means is its only function is to, is to conduct air. It doesn't really participate in gas exchange. All it does is it lets air pass in and out from the mouth into the respiratory zone. And the respiratory zone is where gas exchange really occurs, in the respiratory bronchioles and the alveolar sacs, okay? So next is lung cells, so we're looking really microscopic, and we're gonna start with the alveoli now. So alveoli have a couple of type of lung cells. First is the type one pneumocyte. These are squamous type of cells. They line 97% of the alveoli surface, and they're thin, which allows for optimal gas diffusion, okay? So you can see in this picture here, these are the yellow stuff here, type 1 pneumocytes. You can see here, this is the alveoli, alveoli, and in, in the middle is the blood. Okay. And the easy way to remember is this looks straight up like a type 1. Like it looks like the number 1. It's so thin. So type 1 pneumocyte is the thin one. Okay. Type 2 pneumocytes. These are cuboidal and clustered. They're not showing the picture, so draw them in. Cuboidal, kind of clustered. You see, they only make up about 3% of the alveolar surface, so there's not much of them. And their purpose is to, is to secrete surfactant to decrease alveolar surface tension. We're going to talk more about that later. And that also helps to increase lung compliance. The other thing they do is they regenerate the alve alveolar lining after injury. Okay, So these are precursors to both type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes because they will regenerate the alveolar lining after injury. Finally, we have alveolar macrophages. Like all macrophages, they're basically phagocytose foreign molecules. And they also re release cytokines and growth factors for the so that's like inflammation. All right, looking next is the club cells. Remember where were club cells found? Remember these are found in the terminal and respiratory bronchioles. So these are found in the bronchioles. These are low columnar cuboidal cells, non ciliated. So these guys have secretory granules that help secrete components of surfactant. Okay, they help make components of surfactant. And the next thing they do is they help degrade toxins. Finally, they divide to regenerate cells of the bronchiolar epithelium. So remember, these are in the bronchioles, and they help regenerate cells of the bronchiolar epithelium. Okay, next is the goblet cells. Goblet cells, remember where they, these guys were? Remember, these guys were the trachea, bronchi, and bronchioles. And these guys secrete mucus. So we're going to talk about mucus and cilia now. Remember that cilia go all the way from the trachea to the terminal bronchioles. And cilia propel mucus up towards the pharynx, okay? So let's say this is the trachea. There's cilia here, and this is the pharynx up here in the tongue. These guys will propel mucus up that way. Because you want to do that, because you, if you don't do that, the mucus is going to accumulate. Where mucus were made by the, by the goblet cells, they're going to accumulate and block up and obstruct your airways. You don't want that. So you need to clear the mucus out. Okay. The other thing that cilia are responsible for are clearing out most of the inhaled particles that enter the bronchial tree. So a lot of those particles will get, actually get stuck in the in the mucus and those are going to get swept out. They're also going to sweep, sweep out other particles and that's thanks to the cilia. However, if you have tiny particles, specifically less than 2 micrometers in size, these are going to be able to evade, so these small guys here, they're going to evade the cilia, they're going to make it all the way to the alveoli. Okay. Well, what do we what do we say deals with this stuff that makes it all the way to the alveoli? Well, we said that alveolar macrophages will phagocytose these tiny particles. 
However, we're gonna see this. We're gonna see this in a problem in the pathology later. But what, basically, what happens is, what do the macrophages release? Remember what we said they release? They release cytokines, and so and growth factors as well. So these tiny particle, particles, when they when they're phagocytosed by alveolar macrophages, they're gonna stimulate the release of these cytokines. It's gonna cause inflammation and injury to the alveoli. You're also gonna get growth factors that induce growth and fibrosis. So this is how you can get some lung fibrosis in. Um, and that's, that's not good. It's going to be decreased lung function. And that can arise from inhalation of inorganic dust. So we're going to talk more about that later in a second. Okay, so that's it for our lung anatomy.